Gabriel Shapiro is a general counsel at Delphi Labs and a member of LexPunk, a group of crypto lawyers. He's regarded as one of the most prominent voices in regulations for the crypto space, which has seen lots of activity lately. Recent developments include the latest draft of the DCCPA bill, Sam Bankman frieds proposal, CFTC charging UkiDAO, and the Tornado Cash sanctions. We begin our conversation with Gabriel sharing his thoughts on the current state of crypto's regulatory landscape in the U.S. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's that saying, unfortunately, uh, marred by the fact that it was Elizabeth Holmes who made it famous. But, you know, it's uh, something like, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, first first they deny you and uh, uh, then they mock you uh, and then they fight you. Right. Um, uh, and then eventually uh, you win. Right. Something like that. And uh, I, I would certainly say we're in the then they fight you phase. Um, you know, we're especially in the U.S., uh, where we just have a lot of things going on, right? I, I would say it's a it's a turf war in DC, and it's been a turf war in DC for the last year, but it's heating up, right? Uh, where every single regulatory agency wants a piece of this, every politician wants a piece of this, um, and uh, uh, they are the way they are going about that is to try to interpret current laws as broadly as possible to cover all the activity that's currently going on and taking enforcement actions about that. And then uh, in parallel with that, there are efforts to pass new laws uh, that would, you know, sort of make that crystal clear so that, you know, they, they don't have to risk losing any cases um, by, you know, by just broadly construing the old laws. And, you know, broadly speaking, the, the approach that's being taken in the U.S. anyway, we could talk a little bit about Europe. I'm not a European lawyer, but in the U.S. is to fit square pegs into round holes, right? Um, we have a financial regulatory system in the U.S. that through and through it is premised on the idea of all financial transactions occurring through intermediaries. Um, and as a result of that, the requirements are around each transaction having to be KYC'd, each transaction having to uh, be surveilled and certain reports to be filed about that transaction if it's suspicious, um, the, the, the possibility of reversing transactions uh, if they don't comply, blocking transactions if they are among certain people, sanctions laws, right, and these sorts of things. Um, and it, it simply doesn't work for autonomous crypto systems, which the entire point of them uh, is to allow people to do things peer-to-peer -peer without intermediaries who could ensure those types of rules are being complied with, right? So it's a, it's a major, major paradigm clash. And rather than saying, hey, this is a new thing, we need new types of regulations around it. They, they are just trying to define in the software into the current laws and in doing, and not really explain how they could comply. And in so doing, it, it basically becomes a, a backdoor prohibition about creating or promoting or profiting from uh, that type of software, right? And instead, they only want uh, platforms that are intermediated in effect. So yes, that unfortunately is the current state in the US. In the rest of the world, uh, I think it's more positive. You know, the UK, uh, the UK Law Commission has been very crypto positive, is exploring a lot of things. Um, I think in uh, 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 Europe just passed, uh, you know, this, this MICA framework, right, which is passed by the EU Parliament, will have to be adopted by the states. But it's really aimed quite clearly at uh, crypto intermediaries like uh, centralized exchanges. And the requirements that it imposes upon them are actually quite reasonable for the most part. It's not like a US style financial regime where before you do anything, you have to go to a regulator and get approval, right? Um, uh, uh, like with like with the SEC in the U.S., before you can have a freely trading security, you have to get SEC registered, and that involves millions of dollars in compliance costs per year, which is not suitable, obviously, for a startup or a small developer team. And it also requires at least a year to get that approval. So by the time you you know even if you wanted to pursue this path for DeFi, right? Uh, 
you know, by the time you started and you took a year, your product would already be completely irrelevant by the time you got the approval, right? And then they, they do take the position that if you were ever to amend the, the software, that that would require uh, an amendment and a re-registration process, a new offering. So um, it's simply not feasible. And yeah, the, the hostility, unfortunately, is undeniable. Do you think that the the fact that the the U.S. is taking a a, a more you know like a a, a, a harsher a, approach to crypto or a more limiting approach to crypto than uh, Europe and and the U.K. and you know other I guess like competing powers is that uh, bad for crypto or or bad for the U.S. like uh, The fact that the U.S. is obviously such a, a big economic power in the world, you know, it does have the, the, the you know, it, 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 it can like limit growth for, for the industry. But, you know, another side of that argument is crypto is so important, is, is such an important innovation that not making uh, a regulatory framework that's fr friendly for this new industry will actually end up hurting the U.S. I mean, what, what camp do you, do you stand in? Yeah, I think, I, I don't think, I think it's both, honestly. Uh, the, on the one hand, right, it, it depends on your thesis about why crypto technologies are valuable. Right. But a lot of people take the view that the reason they're valuable is because they limit the power of sovereigns and therefore they increase self-sovereignty. Right. Um, and, and I personally take that view. Right. So from that point of view, if we lived in completely laissez-faire societies with no financial regulations, then crypto would neither be necessary nor desirable nor valuable. Right. Uh, because you could do whatever you want on a, on a totally centralized basis. Right. Governments would just be allowing that. There still would be some cases where it's useful. Right. You know, because we have intermediaries like PayPal and, you know, they, they may have certain interests and crypto would let you go more direct. But at the end of the day, a, a lot of this is about self-sovereignty. And so if there were no sovereigns, none of this would matter. Right. So from that point of view, it's helpful because it just makes the technology more and more valuable. Right. The more onerous the surveillance requirements and the laws and the more people they lock out of uh, potentially sharing in prosperity because they can't sort of manage their own risks and take risks. Instead, they can only buy safe things, you know, that pay annualized 4% year after year forever. Um, uh, uh, the, um, you know, it's helpful, right? Because it's, it's making these things valuable and we're all investing in these things. On the other hand, right, uh, in, the, in the shorter to medium term, right, undeniably, uh, you know, it, it's, there are going to be a lot of innovators who want to be in this space who get arbitrarily prosecuted for it, right, without being scammers, without being fraudsters, just honest, good faith innovators who are running into these laws. And the government's not going to go every single one of them. There are too many of them. But they'll go after some, and those people are kind of like martyrs for the cause, right? And But it sucks, right? It, it sucks to have martyrs. It sucks to see people thrown in prison uh, like Virgil Griffith, you know, for just giving a seminar, right, on Ethereum, right? Uh, these things are bad. And I do think um, in terms of like whether... The, what the U.S. is doing is good for the U.S. itself, right? Uh, no, it's not good, right? Because for several reasons, right? Number one, just look at, you know, sort of the saber rattling on stable coins, right? Right now, USD denominated stable coins are the dominant thing. And it's almost like exporting the U.S. financial system to other countries. And it's part of the fact that the U.S. is the reserve currency and all those things, right? If you limit that and you don't provide a an attractive alternative, and I don't believe these CBDCs will, will ever be a really attractive alternative, then uh, what you are, you are creating an opportunity for your competitors like China and other nations to allow such stable coins pegged to their currencies, and then more people will start using those their currencies as a reserve, right? And that will give them more uh, leverage on the international scene uh, and a better reputation and all these things, right? Um, so, it, it and, and then of course, people will leave the US, people are leaving the US who are specialists in this area and understand it, uh, and therefore the US will have brain drain uh, and they'll lose expertise and uh, they won't be able to compete as well in the 
the in the Game of Thrones uh, that is international diplomacy when Russia and North Korea and other countries, China, that they may not like, maybe would potentially be friendlier uh, and may may have rolled out the welcome mat for people who really understand uh, this new world of autonomous systems and autonomous economies. So uh, it's, it's just very bad and very short-sighted all around. Uh, I can't really see any good in it personally. Yeah, it's pretty baffling to me as well. It's like, I, I wonder what what effect it would have had in the U.S. if it wasn't at the center of other major, you know, innovations uh, like like you know the internet um if silicon valley wasn't in the u.s or or, or previous or, or not even tech related but you know the u.s has been just like the center of finance like you have wall street is like the center um what if now kind of the new center of of tech and and finance was somewhere else like i, I wonder how that would impact the u.s in the long term um and then I'd love to get, you mentioned this kind of turf war happening. Um, I'd love to get just like a clear sense of like who these players are, just to kind of understand the, the, the landscape right, right now. Like who, uh, who's vying for, for jurisdiction o over what uh, in crypto? Sure. So uh, obviously, we have different in the U.S. Uh, you know, for some of the international audience that may be watching, uh, you know, regulatory agencies are, are sort of uh, autonomous uh, to a large degree, right? They they have they do have a congressionally controlled budget, right? But they, it's not like um, it's not like they're they're it's not like the U.S. president or the Congress is like the boss of Gary Gensler, who's chair of the SEC, right? Like they can't call him up and be like, Gary, stop doing that, right? Uh, you know, they may have conversations with him, right? You know, if Biden didn't like something Gensler did, Biden might say, hey, man, I appointed you and we talked about it would be this way. And you said this. I mean, come on, man, like, you know, do what you said. But like he's autonomous at the end of the day. He can pretty much, you know, do what he wants as long as he doesn't break the law. Um, and so, uh, you know, the people in these agencies, they have their own long term political careers uh, uh, or, you know, sometimes they want to go back into private practice and make a lot of money or whatever. But they have agendas. Um, and what they are doing is they are competing for resources from Congress uh, to get as much money as possible and to oversee as many things as possible so that they can um, uh, uh, achieve great things, right? Things that, to put on their resume, so to speak. Hey, I was the guy who figured out crypto regulation and we prosecuted, uh, you know, uh, 40 different nefarious crypto actors and we pioneered the laws, all these things, right? And, you know, that's that's going to be helpful for them in their careers, right? So, yes, they're competing to, to be the top dog. Uh, and since crypto is one of the few things that doesn't have clear regulations yet, right? Naturally, that's a good target for them, right? To make their name and, and make their reputation. So, you know, you have the SEC, right? Which is regulator of securities and securities markets in the US. You have the CFTC, which has regulatory authority over commodities derivatives currently. And then there's a bill pending called the DCCPA that would also give it regulatory authority over commodities spot markets. Uh, currently, it only has fraud authority over those, right? Can't make up new rules or really regulate the structure of that market. Uh, uh, there's what's called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was originally started as sort of a banking uh, consumer protection, uh, a, an organization for protecting consumers against banks, but now uh, is also trying to go after crypto in kind of the same manner. It was it's sort of Elizabeth Warren's baby. She's been very anti-crypto, as you know. Um, there's the IRS, obviously, right, when it comes to tax. They, they want to get as much tax revenue from crypto as they can. Uh, and then there's FinCEN, right, uh, which is responsible for enforcing the Bank Secrecy Act and some other regulations that are essentially um, – rules about how financial certain financial intermediaries most financial intermediaries have to KYC people watch out for you know suspicious uh, uh, activities report them to the government uh, uh, and 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 so on and then there's there's also OFAC right which um, uh, is uh, can um, 
essentially say, hey, Americans are not allowed to transact with certain bad people who we don't want Americans doing business with, Iran, uh, certain specific Russian oligarchs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? And and that's kind of it. And they, they all want to use this to increase their budgets. They all want to use this to say, hey, uh, I'm the one who figured out how this agency deals with crypto. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm tough on crime, so to speak, or, or whatever the message might be. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's kind of a feeding frenzy. And of course, you have Congress, right? And Congress is, is consists of politicians who try to have long careers and get donations. So some of them are already heavily sponsored by TradFi, right? And TradFi probably doesn't like DeFi because it's a potential competitor, right? And they say, hey, we want to play by the same rules. There shouldn't be two sets of rules. Uh, and, you know, I've given, I've donated millions of dollars to you, uh, Elizabeth Warren or whoever it is. You better fix this, right? Uh, uh, and then there's... Um, you know, there's uh, others who maybe are younger politicians and they see this as an opportunity to get a big donor like SBF or, or what have you um, uh, to be cool on the crypto scene. And they might end up being more pro crypto. Right. Uh, you know, and so far, that's kind of mainly been Republicans. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's kind of the dynamic. Right. Um, and it's chaotic. <laughs> Check out SendGo, a new wallet with multi-chain support to keep your crypto, NFT, and digital assets secure. They aim to make private key vulnerability a thing of the past by leveraging advanced cryptography called MPC and using biometrics for account recoverability. Download the Zengo app from the App Store or Google Play. That's Z-E-N-G-O. And use code DEFIANT to get $20 back on your first purchase of $200 or more. That's Defiant for $20 back on your first purchase of $200 or more when you download Sengo from the App Store or Google Play. Terms and conditions apply and see site for details. There are at least seven different entities that govern crypto in the US. These are the SEC, CFTC, CFPB, IRS, FinCEN, OFAC, and Congress. An acronym salad and a huge headache for entrepreneurs looking to navigate the space. Is it possible to set an overarching regulatory framework for crypto? Right. Ideally, yeah, what would happen is what you described, right? People would say, hey, this is a new, new technology, a new type of market. Let's just create a new set of regulations specifically for this and a new regulator to oversee that, right? Uh, you know, rationally speaking, that would... 100% be the best move. But it's just never going to happen in the US. It's just uh, there are too many existing um, interests. Our, our Congress is always very evenly divided and uh, you know doesn't, doesn't act with a unified voice. Uh, hard to get really bold, innovative things passed. Um, so yeah, although that would be ideal, uh, that's not going to happen. We're going to have this crisscrossing overlap where you got to worry about all these different regulators with everything you do. Sadly, that's just realism. Okay, so this is where, in, in this context, is where this DCCPA bill uh, fits in, right? Like this is um, the CFTC uh, drafting a new bill that's that's not specific for crypto, right? It's uh, like you said, it's it's a bill that uh, will uh, allow the, the CFTC to oversee spot commodities markets, and I guess. Uh, like digital assets, digital commodities would fall under under that bill. Is that right? Right. Well, yeah. A couple things there. The the CFTC didn't draft it. Um, the you know uh, po politicians drafted it, but I would imagine that they probably have some conversations you know with the CFTC commissioners about how it would work, and it certainly would be good for the current CFTC commissioners, right? Because they would have more power and probably could get a bit bigger budget and all those things, right? Um, and the it is it is really about digital assets, right? It's it's say, trying to say that specifically for digital assets, the CFTC would have uh, jurisdic regulatory jurisdiction over spot markets in those. Um, and so yeah, it, it's it's squarely about crypto, um, and and it's really really targeted crypto. Now the interesting thing though, right, is you know it doesn't it doesn't say crypto, right? It says digital assets, and so. Uh, you know that that could presumably mean um, like uh, like like Fortnite V Bucks, 
right? Uh, it, can mean, it can mean World of Warcraft money. I mean, there, there's just so many consequences to this sort of thing. And like, so like, is the intent here to give the CFTC regulatory oversight over video game economies? I mean, it, you know, it's just crazy. But honestly, that that could be a side effect of the bill. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'd love to get kind of your main uh, takeaways. Like, what uh, what is it proposing, uh, and and how would the CFTC kind of regulate crypto if, if this was passed? Sure, it, it, it you know I'll say uh, although I, I've kind of made somewhat of a big deal over over the bill and I'm against the bill. Uh, I mean, the first thing to note is that it's a little bit of a red herring, in that. The CFTC just took a big regulatory action against a DeFi protocol, right? Called, uh, which is currently called Uki Protocol, it used to be called BZX Protocol, right? And so, uh, and it and it did that before this law passed. So, in other words, it did that under current law. Uh, so, the CFTC already has arguments and interpretations and understandings under current law that would basically, if, if proven out in court, allow the CFTC to kill DeFi as we currently know it, right? So this bill neither stops, neither you know creates a threat from the CFTC for DeFi, nor does it stop the current threat, right? Um, it's just sort of... Uh, just sort of adding insult to injury, right? Because in theory, in theory, if there were a DeFi system that purely concerned um, n uh, uh, digital assets that are not derivatives, like like Dogecoin, right? Just imagine like a DEX, for example, all it had on it is BTC, ETH, Dogecoin, right? Well, Current, currently, the CFTC would not have regulatory authority about it. There would have to be some type of leverage involved, or some type of liquid staking derivative, or some type of, um, you know, what's called a swap, not in the Uniswap sense, but uh, uh, in a different sense, um, for it to have authority. But they're really so. Yes, it's adding to their authority in terms of DeFi. But on the other hand, there are almost no such systems, right? Like if you look at Uniswap, I can find things on Uniswap that the CFTC could argue are derivatives, right? Um, like any liquid staking token, for example. DAI, for example, could be argued to be some type of swap or, or derivative because its value is based on the value of, of various collaterals, right? Um, so the CFTC kind of could already do this. But that being said, because it's very, very broad and it basically just says, hey, CFTC, you get all of this, people would like to see in it uh, so some type of carve out for DeFi um, and, and some other thoughtful provisions around crypto to, to not increase their power uh, unfairly, I think. So um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I kind of wanted to at least like set the stage that it, it's probably a little bit less radically changing things than people realize because there already is this legal fight that has to be fought in the courts of whether the CFTC can go after DeFi, whether or not this law passes, basically. Got it. Okay. But I mean, would having this this bill at least provide just like more more clarity on you know where the CFTC stands and you know how it can regulate digital assets. In certain respects, I mean, I think it could be good if it were limited to pure uh, centralized exchanges and to true um, service providers, true intermediaries. I mean, the bill kind of makes sense for that, right? It says, "Hey, uh, you're someone who is like a Doge broker or whatever. Um, we're going to impose some legal obligations on you. You're going to have to register." You're going to have to uh, make sure that you're solvent. If someone's laundering uh, Doge through you, you're going to have to file suspicious activity reports. You're going to have to know who they are, things like that. And, you know, I, I mean, I think that kind of makes sense for someone who's running that type of business, right? Um, so it, in that way, it's not bad. It's just that the, the way that it's drafted is so broad um, that you you can't tell that that it's only aimed at those businesses. It also could be aimed at software or people who play, uh, who or people who who use software or market software in a way where they yes, it's sort of like a business from them for them, but they don't really have control over it and they don't have a customer relationship with the people who are using the software. But that the the law would basically be be. Forcing them to to do that, to have to be a full intermediary, or to just stop 
helping anything with the software or having any type of business related to the software. And so that that's where people get upset. That's where it's ambiguous. You know, that's that's where people want changes. I thought the the, the new draft uh, made that distinction between um, a, a centralized intermediary and and like just software developers, I guess. No one knows if that's a draft that actually will get adopted, right? So yeah, I was kind of talking about the original draft there. You're right. There is a draft floating around that at least um, there are still risks with it, but I think it at least the, the, the most problematic term within the bill was uh, the term uh, uh, digital uh, asset trading facility. I may be leaving out a word or two there, but basically digital digital asset trading facility, right? Digital commodity trading facility. And the way it was originally defined is essentially uh, anything that facilitates uh trades in digital commodities, right? So uh, that, that could be a simple website, right? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a tool for people to, um, I mean, CoinGecko could qualify. I mean, you could say that CoinGecko, or you could say that Etherscan, a block explorer, facilitates because it's giving them and a Ethereum bunch of information node. about it. That's right. And, and Ethereum node as well, right? So, so they, now they, they did cover the node point, arguably, because they carved out validators um, and they, uh, uh, they added in this one draft, they added an additional carve out that says, well, if, if all you do is write and publish software, you're, you are not a person who's responsible for registering this type of facility, right? But so that's good in the sense that, you know, for any people out there who are like pure open source developers, like a, like an Ethereum core dev, for example, right? You know, they don't really run a business. Uh, they just write the software and post it. Um, for them, I think that would give them good comfort. But vast majority of people in the space don't only write and publish software, right? They might also market the software. Uh, they might promote the software. They might um, there might be governance tokens that they hold some of, but less than a majority of, uh, that help set the parameters of the software once it's been deployed, right? And that carve out wouldn't really help them because their their activities extend beyond merely writing and publishing software. So it, it's still not very good, even that version. And we don't even know if that version will be accepted. Like, uh, you know, someone already some some uh, uh, D, prominent DC guy. I don't quite know who he is, but uh, you know, he already came out and said he will never support any version of the bill. You know, that contains this carve out, right? Um, so we don't quite know where it will go and and how the final version would look. Ah, oh, that's so scary. Um, and, and like you said, it's not like the CFTC needs this bill to already, you know, act uh, against or, you know, charge uh, DeFi and, and, and crypto protocols. Like uh, last month, uh, there was a super interesting case with, with Uki Dao that, that you mentioned. Um, this is the Dao that stemmed from BCX for uh, those of us who've been in the DeFi space for a long time. It's like one of the, just like OGs, I think, uh, lending protocols from like back in 2019. Um, but the, I, I just, I, I thought it was like, just really interesting how the, like the angle that the CFTC came about with, with Uki Dao because it, it's, it's kind of become a, um, common knowledge, I guess, uh, or, or expected that if you have a DAO uh, that's decentralized, uh, where, where, you know, it's, um, it's run by governance and tokens and it's an open source protocol, then you are s somewhat shielded from regulatory action. But then the CFTC came, you know, and charged this very thing, like a DAO controlled by token holders, running an open source protocol, run, you know, with smart contracts. Um, so, and, and the fact that they came after kind of mem like everyone participating in the DAO, I think was also pretty scary uh, for people in DeFi. Um, so can you kind of go through that case and, and whether it is 
cause for for concern? Like, is is nobody safe? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's a very. I uh, yeah. I'm glad you asked me about that because I think there are a lot of misunderstandings about the case online. Um, you know, even even amongst lawyers to an extent, uh, but certainly amongst non-lawyers. So, at a high level, there are two issues in the case, and. One of them has received more attention than the other, but the one that's received less attention is probably the more important one. So just a, a, a very, very abstractly, right, very high level, has a violation of law occurred would be question number one, right? And what is that violation of law? Number two, who is liable for that violation, right? Most of the attention has been on two right, because they sued the Dow, and people said, wow, they're suing a Dow, which I, I don't think has ever really happened before, certainly not by a regulator. Um, and so, you know, that's most of the issues you mentioned, right, like, wow, everyone's jointly and severally liable. Who actually is part of the Dow, right? They defined it as people who have voted their tokens, okay? Why do people who just got the economic benefits of the tokens but never voted them get a free ride, right? Like, what's the logic in that, right? There are all these questions, right? Um, uh, but but the, the, the first question we should be asking is what law was violated, right, and who actually violated it, right? So what under the commodities laws, uh, there is a rule that says you cannot engage in a uh, transaction that involves a commodity and leverage, margin, or financing – except on a, a regulated CFTC registered exchange with the exception of what are called eligible contract participants, which is sort of like accredited investor rules, but tougher, right? So, uh, so basically it, these transactions are supposed to be illegal unless they take place on that type of exchange. Obviously, BZX protocol and any smart contract system is not that type of exchange. So when the CFTC goes online and it reads a description of BZX protocol that says, you can leverage your crypto, right? You can buy crypto on margin, whatever it is. They say, well, look, obviously this is violating this law and we got to find who's responsible. So they went after the developers, right? And then the, for some period of time, uh, and then to go after the DAO for the current period of time uh, where the DAO is running it. Um, so, so that's that's the that's what violation of law has occurred, and they basically just say, look, this is a, a whoever is running this platform is violating the law crudely, right? The DAO is running it now. The the development team was running it before. So I think you could actually attack both those positions. Um, number one. Uh, it's not completely clear to me that a violation of law has occurred, right? Because although the law does speak of leveraged transactions, and this is a leveraged transaction, the law was written with uh, a framework in mind where when you enter into a transaction, that's a, that's a contract, that's a legal agreement between two counterparties where each of them is making promises to the other, an exchange of promise and performance, and they both have risks uh, uh, posed by the other, right? Um, they have to trust the other to a certain extent, and that if there is an issue with that transaction, ultimately they might go to a court of law to, to enforce some obligation or uh, seek damages from the person who didn't hold up their end of the deal. Right. Um, and so when you're dealing with a smart contract system, however, uh, in my opinion, these these are not legal agreements. Rather, uh, people have opted into a set of software mediated uh, incentives um, that enables them to get leverage in a very non-traditional way without counterparties, without a legal agreement. Right. Um, so did Congress really intend that this sort of thing be under that law? I think it's debatable. Right. So that's one thing. The other thing is uh, who is actually if there is a legal violation. Right. Who who is who is violating the law. Right. So what the developers did is they wrote some software, they deployed it. And yes, they promoted it. 
right? And they might have had some limited control over it after it was deployed, but you know, it, it, it probably was limited and they probably didn't really exercise it. It basically was just software that people were using. So the CFTC wants to equate those actions with being what's called a, a futures commodities merchant. But a futures commodities merchant is very, very different, right? Like they're, they're going out, they're actually offering to be a counterparty. They're offering the leverage. They're offering the financing. They're saying, hey, you want to you wanna do leverage? Cool. We'll take, your, uh, we'll take your assets as collateral and we'll extend credit to you. And then you can go and use the, the credit to gamble on more assets. And then we'll liquidate you at a certain price and we'll profit if you lose, et cetera. That is not what a smart contract developer does. The smart contract developer is not the one offering the financing. They're offering the software. Depositors come to the software. At most, you could argue that those different depositors are offering each other the leverage through the software, right? They're the counterparties, right? Um, and so really, from that point of view, who the CFTC should be suing, arguably, are, is, is not the developers, but perhaps the users of the system who took that software and under the CFTC's understanding did illegal things with it, right? It's not really developers. Now, they could have argued, yes, all those other people broke the law when they used the system, but you, the developers, aided and abetted their violations of law, right? And that would be a very different thing. That wouldn't be saying, "Hey, developers, you're a futures, you're an unregistered futures commodities merchant that should be, uh, you know, have all these KYC obligations and all these things." Instead, they would be saying, "You helped out some other people violate the law, and we want to punish you for that." But it's legally very, very different theories, uh, and they went for the theory that I think makes less sense under the law. Uh, same thing with the DAO, right? Even more so, right? Because what the DAO really is, right, if you think about liquidity, the fact that the governance tokens are distributed to people who use the system in liquidity mining, what, what I think the protocol DAOs are for, it's to empower the users of the system to protect their own interests in using the system. Right, um, like because they rely on the system, they're at risk from the system. They should have a governance voice in any changes that happen to the system, parameter changes, etc., because it's going to affect them. Right, Th that's what I think the purposes of these DAOs are. Yes, some people who are not users might buy the token, and, and maybe we should talk about whether that's the right way to do it and things like that. But at the end of the day, that's the intent. Um, so, you know, if I that changes things, right? Because I'm no longer, you know, the if I'm a governance token holder, you can't say I'm just using my governance tokens to run a business for some customers. I'm the customer, <laughs> right? And I don't necessarily care a whole lot about the other customers or even have the same interests as them. I'm looking out for my own interests. They might be very different from others. So the CFTC, though, wants to say, no, 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 this is just a partnership and it's just running a commodities exchange. It's just like you took SBF and you split them up into 30 people, um, but they're all running the same business and they just have customers. But, but I don't think that's accurate. Right, so uh, that, that's another sort of disputable thing within their within their position, or something that they're not understanding. Um, is you know, so just to sum it up, number one, the people they accused of being unregistered FCMs are nothing like FCMs uh, because they're not the ones offering the leverage. Um, uh, uh, in the in the case of the developers, in the case of DAO participants, they are the actual like customers who are looking out for themselves. They're not the business, right? Number two, it ignores the fact that the reason why people hold these governance tokens is not because they're all kumbaya with each other and necessarily have the same interests. It's to look after their own interests, right? So uh, there's a lot that's debatable there, and I think it'll be fought out. But it's a paradigm clash at the end of the day. This episode is also brought to you by Circle, the sole issuer of USDC. USDC is always redeemable one-to-one -one for US dollars, has over 45 billion in circulation as of October 13th, and lets users easily access both TradFi and crypto financial services. Check out circle.com backslash transparency to see USDC's weekly reserve breakdowns and monthly attestation reports, and find out why USCC is a trusted stablecoin. 
In comparison to other projects in DeFi which offer similar services, UkiDAO is a relatively small player. If the CFTC can come after UkiDAO, does this mean they can use similar arguments to chase the biggest players in the space, such as Aave and Compound? I'm so glad you asked that because people are not understanding that the same exact arguments uh, that are used in that case would make all of DeFi illegal. I, I'm going to say it, 100% of DeFi would be illegal under this reasoning. Why? Well, pretty much all of DeFi involves margin, <laughs> financing, or leverage, right? It, it's the core. That is the core of financialization. So, of course, if it's decentralized finance, it all does those things. The one thing you could maybe argue is outside of it would be an AMM. Right, because an AMM is not necessarily extending credit or allowing people to extend credit to one another. However, there is another category of regulated thing under the commodities laws called a commodity swap. And what a commodity swap is, uh, is essentially any asset that has its value based upon the value of some other asset, right? So I don't think there is any meaningful DEX out there that doesn't have on it things like uh, DAI, which is collateralized by a variety of assets and therefore its value is based on those assets, right? Uh, or um, uh, 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 you know, liquid staking derivatives, right? Where you know you've deposited your ETH somewhere and you get some liquid token out, but that liquid token's value is based on the value of the deposit. Every DEX is going to have that, or since, right? Since, like, you know, synthetic Apple stock or whatever it might be, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so yes, 100% of DeFi is illegal under the CFTC's reasoning in the UkiDAO case. Um, so between this SEC who is saying, you know, who's, you know, th they've said multiple times, um, almost any token under the sun is a security, except for Bitcoin and ETH. Um, and the, the CFTC who is taking these like, just like very hardline arguments, um, that, you know, would make most of, or all of DeFi illegal, like the U S I mean, do you think like U S regulators right now have the power to like completely clamp down on, on DeFi if they wanted to, they have the. They have legal arguments they can make, right? But they have to, the, I mean, the, the positive side of American law is that it's very facts and circumstances based. Um, you have to, uh, we have robust due process rights under the constitution and otherwise. We have a robust, sophisticated legal system, sophisticated judges, appellate courts, all these things, uh, you know, great lawyers, expensive lawyers, but great lawyers. Um, we have a, a really good legal system uh, that in many respects is fair. Even if the content of the laws is not fair, the process is mostly fair. Um, and so therefore, uh, although they probably consider themselves to have that legal authority. It's not easy for them to exercise. It. They have to bring individual cases. They have to do investigations. They have to marshal facts. They have to sue people, right? Um, they, and they might lose some of the cases. The judge has to listen to it. The people can appeal. It can go on and on for years and years. And even if they win one, it's not like they automatically win the other ones, even if they're fairly similar, because even minor distinctions could be legally relevant and they could have to relitigate the whole case and so on and so forth. So, you know, on the plus side, it's not like they can come out and just destroy all of this tomorrow, right? They have to go to court and they have to win case after case after case after case, right? And then in the meantime, it's not like all these things are static, right? The, the technology is getting more decentralized. We have zero knowledge proofs where people anyone who's involved in these transactions will be able to say, hey, I don't even know what who's transacting. I don't even know what the transactions are. How can I possibly be liable for that? All these types of things will be developing. Uh, people will now pay more attention to trying to decentralize the front ends as well, right? And, and trying to develop trustless solutions for that. So it, it's a dynamic cat and mouse game and you know they can't just destroy it, right? I mean, that, that's the good news. Okay, so um, thank God for American institutions, I guess, <laughs> like that there being some some like due process. Um, so I, I think 
what would be kind of the like the way to 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 regulate this um, fairly? Do you think? Because I mean, if 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 you like just like standing on kind of the CFTC's uh, position and 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 just like taking their side, I, I do see kind of the case for for saying. You know, these are really derivatives that are being traded on unregulated exchanges, you know, and, and, and we can argue, like, who's responsible for that? Like, should software developers be responsible? Should token holders be responsible? But in, in the end, like, at the core, um, that's what's happening. Like, there's derivatives that are being traded. Um, so, I mean, where like how, how to move forward from there like should that be regulated can it be regulated i don't know it's just like it's just like very difficult but i you know I, i kind of see that that point right uh yeah sure i mean yeah i i think i think they're not derivatives within the original meaning that congress contemplated when it passed these bills to be honest but I reasonable minds could differ on the subject and you know I think courts will have to decide that right so but let's let's assume for the moment that they are derivatives right let's let's assume that all tokens are securities uh, you know just for the sake of argument uh, personally I'm not anti-regulation like I think regulations um, are like serve important purposes and I actually think they could make Uh, DeFi and crypto and Web3 better if they were intelligently crafted, right? And, you know, if you look back at my really old tweets, like, you know, uh, like I, I was saying all, I was saying basically, yeah, like tokens are securities. We just need new rules for that specific type of security, right? Um, you know, and I, I don't think that's an unreasonable position. What, what makes it unreasonable or impracticable is that they never made the new rules, right? They're trying to fit them under the old ones. Um, so, you know, in terms of what I, what I think should be the case is I do think there should be certain regulations, but I think at the end of the day, they should respect civil rights. They should respect the difference between using software or being involved with software and being a financial services intermediary. And they should be designed to maximize the, the value uh, and usefulness of the technology rather than to destroy it and discourage its use, right? So in my opinion, what that would look like is it would be a very permissive disclosure-oriented regime, right? Kind of like the securities laws, right? The original idea behind the securities laws was basically, hey, you can, uh, you can sell a security, You just have to give really good disclosures about its nature and the risks and who's involved and conflicts of interest and things like that, right? And you know, I, I think that's a great law. Yeah, if you're if you're involved in something, if you're profiting from it, you should give people very honest and good and complete information about it. Over time, that disclosure regime has morphed into a permissioning regime because it is a uh, so extensive that and it requires so many different types of intermediaries to essentially give audits which are really you know almost like certifications that um, only the most blue chip successful mature companies can possibly comply with that regime so even though it is nominally a disclosure regime in reality Almost no one can do that disclosure. What I think policymakers, regulators, legislators should realize is that uh, because of this software, it is just such a super scalable way to raise money, engage in transactions, etc., that they just can't take that approach, right? If they take that approach, people will just break the law. Right, because it's just very, very easy to do, and um, you know, uh, 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 you know, they they want to be able to launch things, they want to be able to experiment, and you know, if the U.S. doesn't let them do it, they'll find someplace else to do it, or they'll just become increasingly anonymous and do it anonymously. Right. So instead, what they should do is just say, look, this is a very different type of asset. It has different types of risks. What we're going to do for this type, right, is we're as long as people just accurately disclose the things we want them to disclose and make that public and keep that up to date, go ahead and do it. Uh, and if you lie about it, right, we're going to come after you. We're going to sue you for fraud. We're going to sue you for making misstatements. Um, so they could do that, right? And I think if they did that, 
I think everyone would be better off, right? Uh, you know, the users would be better off. The developers would be better off because not only because um, they would have a quote unquote safe harbor, but they would have like like a set of guy like a like they would know what what they have to disclose and they would think about all those things. Okay, I have to disclose who my audit my software protocol auditors are. I have to publish the audit. I have to say whether those people had a conflict of interest. Um, I have to say whether I have a conflict of interest. I have to say how many tokens I got. You know, I have to say uh, you know um, uh, uh, whether there are any material weaknesses in security. Whether there are points of centralization. And if if doing that was um, would protect them as opposed to the regulators taking any weaknesses they admit and using that to prosecute them, right? But if instead disclosing weaknesses and risks helped them, they would do it. I guarantee they would do it. And so more information would be out there, all those things. The only reason people are not doing that is because uh, it's, it's not only a disclosure regime, it's also a, you need our permission for this software to exist regime in effect. And, and that's, that's just not acceptable. It's not workable. Right. So I think what Congress should do is say, what things do we want them to disclose? Let's come up with a list and let's, let's pass a law that says they have to do that. But as long as they do that and it's honest and, and they're not committing crimes, uh, in some way, um, you know, l l let's, let's let this exist. Right. And that would be a good first step. And then you, test that, see how it's going for a few years. And then look, maybe there would be some patterns that emerge of abuses or whatever, where you then go to the next step. You then say, okay, it's not just enough to disclose whether you did a software audit, you must do a software audit, right? Or things like that, right? But it's just, it's just premature at this point. And if they start saying such things, people are not going to follow them. So let's just start with bringing people in have some basic rules about what needs to be disclosed. And if they lie or if they don't make the disclosures, sue, sue them sue them to hell, throw them in jail. I'd be fine with that, right? Because it's just disclosure. It's not permissioning. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And what about um, the point about uh, KYC, like both users uh, having to register and also platforms uh, having to have, you know, some sort of, license in order to operate do you think that's that's feasible or desirable no i don't i don't think it's either feasible or desirable right if you have kyc it's not DeFi anymore right um so and i think now you people might consider that reasonable or unreasonable right people who are their top priority is security safety um, prevention of bad acts, right? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll think that that's just unacceptable, but we do have civil rights, right? And if your model for what's happening with this software is that people are engaging in peer to peer transactions, well, we have rights of privacy, right? We, we don't have to, uh, you know, there's not a rule, like I, I can go meet someone in a dark alley and I could, uh, you know, buy, buy uh, uh, you know, buy something legal from them, right? I could, uh, uh, I can make trades with people. I can barter with people. And there, there is no law currently that says every single economic transaction I have to do, I must record that, identify all the parties involved, send that to the government, right? And, and all that stuff. There, there is no such law for very good reason. Um, and essentially it, saying that all DeFi transactions have to be KYC'd is the exact same thing as that, right? It's basically saying you don't have the right to go out and buy, you know, trade with someone uh, privately. You just don't have that right, man. You have to do every single economic transaction you do. You have to know all the parties. Everyone has to know that you did it. Uh, uh, and they have to know exactly what the trade was. That, that's just not fair. That's just not what our rights are. Um, so ultimately, there are trade-offs to everything. And yes, this, this software allows pe private peer-to-peer -peer transactions to occur on a more scalable basis than has ever been the case historically. You don't have to meet the person in the alley or invite them over to your house or go to their store. Uh, instead, you can do it over the internet completely anonymously. I understand that that probably makes some law enforcement uh, harder uh, or creates some additional uh, security threats to the nation or to individual people. But at the end of the day, 
Th those are the civil rights we have. Um, and, and no one wants to live in a complete control state. Just used to be that those transactions were not very scalable, and now they're more scalable. But the principles are the same. Sam Bankman-Fried recently published a proposal detailing his beliefs on crypto regulation, which resulted in community backlash. His proposal included that every crypto transaction should comply with OFAC sanctions, and also that while protocols can be permissionless, front-ends should register as brokers. What does Gabriel think about SBF's proposal? Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I The first thing I would say is it's, it's kind of interesting because I actually think his proposal is more severe than the bill that people are blaming him for. <laughs> um, like, like I don't, I, I think there's like a, there are reasonable arguments, particularly under the newer version of the bill, uh, if that's the one that ends up being passed, that uh, like that bill is not requiring all those things necessarily, right? It's, 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 I think it's kind of debatable. But then he published his, his own view, right? Um, and, and, and that seems very, very onerous and possibly even more onerous than the bill. So that being said, um, D, it doesn't make any sense. His position, honestly, just doesn't make sense, uh, either legally or from a policy basis. You can't just say every transaction needs to comply with OFAC. Every person in the world is not subject to American law, right? Every There might be a country that says that sanctions its citizens from transacting with America, and then America might transact, it might forbid its citizens from transacting with that country. If you have one, if you try to embed this in the protocol, it doesn't make any sense, right? Because the uh, it has to have different different rules for different people. Um, but the whoever the protocol itself should presumably be in some jurisdiction if we're going to treat it this way. And you know, no no person is required to comply with all countries' laws. It, it just doesn't make sense. You'd be censoring everybody for no reason, not even legally required. Right, um, so uh, that just doesn't make sense, right? Now the now the interface thing, um, it makes it makes a little more uh, sense, but I completely disagree with it, right? But I could kind of steel man it, right? Could say, look, uh, you're operating a website, uh, you're operating a DeFi website, and you're in the United States, therefore. Uh, you have to comply with U.S. laws. People are doing financial transactions through the website, which is actually not true. So we'll talk about that. But uh, uh, and therefore, you have sanctions obligations under U.S. law, and you have whatever the KYC obligations are under U.S. law. Okay, that argument I can at least make sense of, right? Um, because yeah, you're you're in a specific place. You're subject to specific laws. The that also, however, does not make sense. The reason why they are pushing for this is because they're saying to themselves, look, we got to keep the base layer permissionless, right? We don't want, uh, you know, validators, miners, et cetera, to have to have sanctions obligations, but someone's got to have them. And so who could that be? Well, we'll make it the people who run the websites. This makes no sense, however, when you consider what the websites are, because the websites are not intermediaries. They're being, they're, it's not even correct to describe them as interfaces because they don't interface with anything. They are essentially specialized block explorers, right? So just like Etherscan displays data about what's on the blockchain, so does the Uniswap website, right? So does the Aave website, all these websites. They are basically just displaying information about what's on the blockchain. They are more narrowly focused to a specific set of data on that blockchain. And so they're able to present it in a more appealing and relevant way because it's specialized. But at the end of the day, that's all it is. So from that point of view, in terms of displaying data, they are no different from CNBC, which displays stock ticker prices, right? CNBC is not regulated as a securities exchange because it displays stock ticker prices, nor should the Unisop website be regulated as a commodities derivatives exchange because it might display some information about commodities derivatives. Now, however, they do have an additional feature, uh, and this is where it gets a little tricky, which is that you can do something that it, it looks to a naive eye. It looks like you're doing a trade 
on or through the website, right? Like you can pick an asset and you can, you know, pick pick another asset and you can set a price that, you know, that you would want to trade them at and you can click a button, you know, that says trade. And it, it looks, I get it because it looks like you're doing a trade through the website. Uh, however, that is not what you are doing. <laughs> you are not doing a trade through the website. The website is essentially acting kind of like Windows OS, right? When you go on Windows, it looks like you're, um, you know, like uh, 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 moving some window around or something like that. But really, what that there's no window, uh, and you're not actually moving anything. The the OS is providing um, an appealing layer of abstraction that assists you with giving uh, technological commands to your computer, right? But in this case, that the, the website isn't even doing that because it doesn't send your commands anywhere, right? It helps you figure out what you want to do, and it essentially generates a data object, and it gives that data object not to someone else on your behalf. It does not send that data object anywhere. It does not send it to a broker. It does not send it to an exchange. It doesn't even send it to a miner or a validator. It doesn't send it. It gives it to you, the user. Now, you as a user might have a separate application called a wallet on your browser, and instead of you know, just showing you what the data object is, it might give you the convenience of directly putting that data object into your wallet. But at the end of the day, you are looking at your wallet and you are deciding what you want to do with that data object. You can change the parameters around. You can change the, the fees you want to pay, the gas price, right? Uh, uh, um, you can send it to the default RPC node that is paired with that uh, uh, wallet, or you could send it to your own RPC node that you might be happening to run, or your friend's RPC node. That, but you are the one sending it. That website is not doing any of that for you. It is not interacting with the blockchain for you. It is not executing the trade for you. So. Historically, we as a society have not regulated mere software tools, mere software assistance tools, uh, uh, um, or, or, or informational uh, uh, gateways like CNBC, right? We have not regulated those as financial intermediaries or as having sanctions obligations, even though people can take that information or use that assistance and it might facilitate them doing some illegal transaction, right? Uh, we just haven't regulated that for good reason, because it's not intermediation. It's not a financial service. It's an information service and it's a technology interaction service, right? Like an OS or something like that. And that's just not how we think about those things. And we have the First Amendment that's supposed to uh, 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 um, give us a right to free flow of information within certain limits. So, uh, Although it looks a lot like an intermediary, it's just not an intermediary. Ultimately, it is a person who is doing a transaction for themselves, and it has nothing to do with that website operator. It's a very slippery slope, right? Because think about what Bloomberg Terminal is for the stock market. Bloomberg Terminal is the same damn thing. It's just, a, it's just an interface, right? Um, in fact, Bloomberg Terminal probably does more than a typical DeFi website. Um, and you don't regulate the stock market by regulating Bloomberg Terminal, right? It's just a skin. It's just a tool, right? Um, so although it is tempting from a policy perspective to say, hey, we got to give them something. We don't want to give them the base layer. Give them websites. It just doesn't make sense in terms of the whole way all of our laws and society and the First Amendment and our software freedoms work. It just doesn't make sense. So I, I don't support it. I don't think it is legal because I think it would violate people's rights. Um, you know, and, and I don't think it's a good solution. And I think it would cause a huge mess. Uh, uh, and it would be bad because what would happen is a lot of good people who are running such informational websites would stop doing so. Scammers would start running them instead. Scammers would start sending bad 
trying to deceive people by sending them bad JSON objects that don't do the things that the user actually wants. Instead of just doing the trade that they want, it just sends all the money to the scammer's wallet, right? And it, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a horrible idea. It just makes no sense. And I, I, I'm surprised that an intelligent guy like SBF, who I would assume understands the technology, would propose something like this. It seems desperate and it seems wrong. Desperate how? I mean, is, is there... I think, you know, you, you, you can be a, a bit um, cynical here and just look at kind of what his motivations are. You know, I, I know that just like starts to get very speculative, but, you know, he, he is the owner of one of the biggest centralized exchanges. So it can be very self-serving to argue, you know, you know, to put forward these kinds of arguments that would essentially, you know, just limit competition. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm as cynical as the next person. I actually don't think SBF is evil. I do think he's pushing for his interests. Um, I do think that he would enormously stand to profit from this type of thing because he could have a front end uh, that is everyone's gateway to DeFi and is CFTC registered. He could probably do that much more easily than other people could, right? Um, and he could even probably start saying, hey, if you want uh, people to have access to your protocol through my uh, interface, you got to give me uh, you know, 5% of your token supply. He could do all kinds of stuff like that, right? And maybe that's his plan. But on the other hand, I also think it's not like he is um, – he, he is also under threat, right? Uh, like he also – like there's not only like benefits that he has from doing this, but there's also dangers that he has from not doing this, right? Because, you know, the there is a regulatory crackdown happening, right? And he, he and his businesses could be targets in that regulatory crackdown. In fact, uh, there – I can't remember what it was, but uh, – I, w I was reading reading a lawsuit quite recently. I think it's a governmental action that was saying, you know, that someone was able to download the FTX mobile app and they were able to trade derivatives, even though uh, they, they're only supposed to offer that to non-Americans, right? There was some kind of type of simple end run or something. And so, you know, he could be facing enforcement actions as well. So, uh, you know, I personally believe that it's not necessarily that cynical, but that a lot of it is like, you know, He's worried that he he might lose his business or have a lot of liabilities for things he's done in the past unless there's kind of a new clear framework and he's seen as someone who is cooperating with that framework. Um, it, there's also the element of you know uh, he may be he may be saying well look if the CFT it's either going to be the CFTC or the SEC I think the CFTC will cooperate with, with me more than the SEC so I'm going to push to get a law passed that makes it clear that it's mainly the CFTC, right? I think that's another thing that's going on, right? Um, so I think it's mixed motives at the end of the day, but sure, some of them are probably cynical. There's so many moving pieces and uh, it's it's so uncertain right now, like what what's going to happen, how every, like how all of these pieces will eventually fall. Uh, but I think this, this point of saying that front ends are essentially a gateway to access technology is a really interesting one uh, because I think um, there, there's there's been this understanding that okay yeah like front ends are like the the, the the centralized intermediaries that that can be more easily regulated uh, but you know looking at it from from the perspective you you laid out um, maybe you know that's that's not even the case. Uh, um, and, and there's there's still kind of this push of making more decentralized front ends anyway, which uh, ho hopefully will will help. Right, and it, and it just shows how arbitrary it is, right? Because if the if the distinction would be, oh, if you download an application and run it on your own, that's fine, but if you run run it on a browser, like that's somehow different. Like like where like it's not even it's not, it's not even clear. Like is it if you run some at the end of the day, they're both applications on a person's computer, right? So is the distinction whether someone is running a backend 
service, right? That that is just kind of you know moving information between the blockchain and the person's browser. Like, but again, it's just providing information. When has providing information ever been a financial intermediary? So yeah, it's weird. Like maybe I could see regulating them as like advisors or something like that, right? Like we do regulate people who provide information about stock, right? Um, but we don't regulate. We don't use them to regulate the entire stock market. Right. Like 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 Jim Cramer, you know, uh, you know, actually, he's, he's a bad example because he probably kind of flats the regulations. But like, you know, an investment advisor is a person who gives advice about securities um, and they have rules related to that specific activity that the information has to be accurate and, and honest and, and, and faithful and so on. I would be fine if there was a rule about DeFi front ends that said, hey, if you report a certain APY, you have to disclose the exact way you calculated that APY, and it has to be accurate. But that's not the proposal. The proposal is that because you provide this information, you are responsible you for the entire market, for KYCing people, for surveilling people, for making sure the market is fair, all these things. It just makes no sense. It just makes no sense. Yeah, and just to like pile on the, the OFAC, a uh, point for for a second it's it's just so crazy to me and it 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 speaks to this just like very us centric mindset that i don't know i think for most people outside of the us it, it yeah it, it's pretty crazy to see someone advocating for you know people anywhere in the world having to comply with this very us specific like sanctioned list um and and it also just highlights how I think lucky uh, people in the U.S. are to have this just like blind trust in their government. Um, because, yeah, like you're saying, okay, I, I'm, I'm giving you 100% um, credibility in that you'll know who to put in on, on this list. Uh, and you're assuming that the U.S. will always kind of be, be right and just like uh, add terrorists to this list or add people who are like absolutely, you know, that you don't want to deal with. But that that can like one day just turn and, and not be the case. Like maybe one day uh, a specific group is targeted and, and put on this list. Like governments can change. So to give a single government like this level of, of power over all like global financial transactions, it's just crazy. I, I really hope this um, this doesn't go through and, and it doesn't end up happening. But um, we're kind of way over uh, the, the hour, so I want to wrap up uh, by just like more of a forward-looking um, uh, question on, you know, like what's what's most needed uh, right now uh, for crypto in the U.S. to thrive from a regulatory standpoint. Like, what would be you know, um, what would you kind of want to see that that's something that's, you know, n not totally out there, but th that's that can actually, you know, be uh, feasible uh, at this point? Right. Well, I kind of already talked about the disclosure based regime, you know, and I would like to see proposals for that. Um, I guess on a on a deeper level, uh, what I really would like to uh, a, a lot of the things I think we've talked about are symptoms of a deeper problem, which is that uh, the, the industry is actually not united, right? Um, be, different types of players have different types of interests. Uh, you know, if you are, um, uh, you know, if you are a centralized exchange, um, then you have a different set of interests from if you are a DeFi software developer right? You might even be somewhat competitive with each other at points, right? Because if DeFi really scales up, you know, maybe you put the centralized ones out of business, right? Um, uh, and, and so there are these different constituencies and um, they're, they're pushing for different things for different reasons. And, and they're simply not, they're not united. Uh, and even if you, you know, I think there are a lot of people in DC who are kind of like down with the cause, passionate about the cause, you know, blockchain association, you know, I, I have my criticisms of them, but I, I think they have good intentions and try to do good things. But their member base, you know, is split among like DeFi people, centralized exchange people, um, like, uh, uh, you know, and uh, like, like probably I would assume miners, I don't really know, but just all, all different types of players. Um, and so it's just very divided, right? And then the, the, 
what, what compounds this is that um, all these things occur in secret, right? So uh, you don't know who, who is tr pushing what agendas, uh, and um, the, the, the rationale for this is, well, you know, if we were to discuss publicly what we're talking about with some senator, then the senator wouldn't listen to anything we say. So it has to be secretive. Um, but it's just the effect of it is that it's just fragmenting everything. It's breeding a lot of paranoia and it's preventing the industry from presenting a united face. We're kind of turning against each other. So what I would like to see is for crypto people, when it comes to these issues, to embrace the crypto ethos, start being transparent with each other, start open sourcing their efforts. And if we all do it, actually, if we all do it, then the politicians will actually not be able to freeze us out uh, for us doing that because then they just won't be talking to any of us, right? So it's a matter of like getting united, being in the same boat and like not trying to exploit the situation for individual advantage. That may be a bit utopian, but you know, since it's kind of a utopian question, I'll, I'll give my utopian answer. <laughs> I love it. Um, this has been awesome, Gabriel. Really, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, really, you know, fascinating arguments. And yeah, let's just I am hope for the best. But uh, I think, you know, having, you know, people like you just laying out uh, all, all kind of the, the, the legal sides of these things and, and making the argument for a, a more like free financial system uh, hopefully helps uh, in, in the process. So uh, thanks so much again for coming on, on the podcast. It was great. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.